last few weeks, <laughs> I've been hammering home the reality that because Calvary 316 is solely focused on being church for Christians, well, we faithfully teach the Bible. What a novel idea. That on Sunday mornings, Christians gather together. It's called the church. There's a service, and we open God's Word and allow God to speak to us, knowing, really, that it's by teaching the Bible that Jesus does something inside of us, that he transforms us, that he shapes us, and he's molding us, and he rebukes us, and he chastises us, and he encourages us. He does all kinds of things through his word with the intention of us becoming more like Jesus so that then we can go into the world and make disciples of the nation, fulfilling the Great Commission. We really believe here at Calvary 316 that 99% of all of the ministry that occurs happens when you leave those doors and you go into your world. And yet, this morning, I do want to explain that while we're dedicated to teaching God's word because we believe it's how Christians are developed, we also teach God's word because we believe it's the only effective mechanism for evangelism. That it's God's word that draws I tend, if you've been with us for any period of time, I tend to rail against what's known as seeker-friendly churches, this particular model. But I want you to know, it kind of irritates me that they've cornered the market, that they've branded themselves as seeker-friendly, as opposed to like, if you don't adopt their model, you're not friendly to seekers. And I completely disagree with that. You see, I think we are seeker-friendly, in the sense that the most important thing that we could ever do for a seeker, the friendliest thing, is not to wow you or entertain you, but to give you what you need, truth. In order to unpack that idea, that the best way to evangelize a lost world is through the teaching of God's word. And in many ways in doing this, contrasting our ministry approach to the larger churches that are around us, I want to take our time together this morning and look at a month-long season of ministry that the Apostle Paul had in the ancient city of Thessalonica. Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 1, we read now when they, and for context, the they are Paul, Silas, and Paul's protege, Timothy, when they had passed through Ampothelus and Apollonia, They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And then we're told this is what Paul said. This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, which means that there were many, joined Paul and Silas. Now these four verses summarize Paul's activities covering a period of what we're told, three Sabbaths, basically a month, three Saturdays. And it's important to point out from the text that Paul's audience included both religious Jews as well as devout Greeks. These were Gentile proselytes of Judaism. And this detail is significant for our purposes this morning because you might as well say that Paul's audience may have very well come straight out of the Bible Belt. This group that Paul is seeking to win over for Christ, they were biblically knowledgeable and spiritually inclined. But tragically, It had been their entire religious structure that was based in a faulty misunderstanding as to the nature of salvation. You see, Paul's crowd, as he goes into this this Sabbath, uh, this synagogue for these three Sabbaths, this crowd, they believed that a person could be saved through, at a minimum, intellectual belief in God, or because of family heritage, or good deeds. Think about that for a minute. They believe that you could be saved. You'd go to heaven through belief. Well, 
I believe in God. I'm going to heaven because, well, I believe in Jesus. Or they would say that I'm going to heaven because of heritage. You know, I was born into a, a Christian home or works. Well, I'm going to heaven because, well, I'm a good person. How? Well, I do these good things. Doesn't that sound like the typical Southerner? Also notice Paul's specific goal here. We're told that, that his desire here is to convince this group of religiously minded Thessalonians of two things. One, that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. The second thing Paul is trying to convince them of, that this Jesus whom he's preaching or literally whom he's her heralding was this Christ or the Messiah. Now, once again, this detail is also important. For while every legitimate church shares this fundamental objective, seeing people come into a saving faith, that's a good thing, right? We want to see people come to know Jesus. Why? Because we were lost and then we were found. We've personally experienced a transformation through an encounter with a person, Jesus. So we want that. We want to see people have the same experience that we did. And yet, not every church agrees as to the most effective way of accomplishing that particular goal. We all want to see people get saved. We just don't all agree on how that should happen. For example, most of the larger churches in the greater Atlanta or Athens area employ what's known as a seeker-friendly model when it comes to church life and evangelism. You might have even heard these ministries tout themselves publicly as literally being church for the unchurched, which, please note, is historically a completely new development within Christianity. It's a, it's a ministry model we have never seen in 2000, in year, 2,000 years. Now, to this point, it really is amazing that over the last decade or so, as this seeker-friendly trend has taken root, we have seen something, a staple of the church, absolutely vanish. It's true that there is no reference to a pulpit in Scripture. But it is interesting to consider not only the pulpit's origins, but the evolution of the pulpit from the days of the Reformation, because I think as you look at it, it tells you a lot. During the 15 and 1600s, as the Bible was being translated into the common languages and being distributed for mass consumption, after we left the Dark Ages where no one studied the Bible, into the Reformation, Enlightenment, when people are looking at the Bible for themselves, one scholar writes, the Reformation not only led to a renewed emphasis upon the sermon, but to the repositioning of the pulpit as being the center of the sanctuary. Church historians believe this took place for, quote, the central position of a fixed pulpit suggested a theological prominence as to the preaching of the word of God within the church. The pulpit grew to symbolize the Reformation's emphasis on the word of God being center to the church and church life, which explains, right, while the reformers were known to have pulpits, I have a picture, the pulpits were perched high above the audience. They were center, they were focal, but they were perched up high for a particular reason, to elevate both the man and the message. Now, Protestant churches since have continued the long-standing tradition of having the pulpit as the central uh, focal of the sanctuary, but there's no question that over time, things have evolved. The pulpit's undergone some transformation over the years that have followed. Consider that it was during the 1800s that the pulpit, while still remaining very ornate, it was moved from the high perch down to eye level. That's not an accident. You see, though the pulpit still maintained the elevation of the message, the new position, well, it served to foster a relatability of the man behind the pulpit. So the message was still elevated, but the man was to be more relatable. Then over the next hundred years, in order to de-emphasize the decadence of the church, 
have a greater appeal to the common man. Pulpits then grew in not just their simplicity, but their functionality. During the eight, uh, 1980s and 1990s, as the church facility modernized, what happened? So did the pulpit. Instead of traditional wood-looking pulpits, you know, one used by Billy Graham, if we could go back to that slide, you know, these wood-looking pulpits, the church is modernizing and what takes place? The pulpits are in all different shapes and sizes. We have metals and glasses and plastics and various technologies all incorporated into the design. Lots of change. Finally, as the United States plunged into a new millennia, society shifted from modernism to what we would call postmodernism. The pulpit experienced probably its most dramatic transformation yet. You see, with the, wa- the rise of seeker-friendly models, which produced corporate megachurches, it was over the last 15 years or so, since the 2000s, that Christianity began to see the worship experience become the primary emphasis of the Sunday service over what? The teaching of God's Word. Sadly, spiritual experience instead of the proclamation of truth, was just more marketable to a postmodern culture. And almost overnight, something fascinating happened. The pulpit, the very thing that had been a staple within the church since roughly 300 AD, it seemingly disappeared. You know, it was in the way of the worship team. And many churches today, pulpits, have been replaced with high-top tables and bar stools. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that all pastors whose pulpits now reside in church storage have done so because of the incursion of postmodern appeal and influence. But it's undeniable the symbolism of seeing the pulpit removed from the church does have historical significance and is representative, in my opinion, of a larger, really negative trend occurring within the church at large. I mean, think about it. Why should a church have as the focal point of their stage the very item that represents the theological prominence of the preaching of God's Word when the preaching of God's Word is no longer the preeminent mechanism for spiritual development or evangelism? In his book, The Priority of Biblical Preaching, Stephen Lawson summed up this new trend, commenting that, quote, a new way of doing church is emerging. And this radical paradigm shift, exposition, is being replaced with entertainment, preaching with performances, doctrine with drama, and theology with theatrics. The pulpit, once the focal point of the church, is now being overshadowed by a variety of church growth techniques, Everything from trendy worship styles to glitzy presentations to vaudeville-like pageantries. And seeking to capture the upper hand in church growth, a new wave of pastors is reinventing church and repackaging the gospel into a product to be sold to consumers. Whatever reportedly works in one church is now being franchised out into various markets abroad. Don't you see that happening? In discussing how he seeks to move a diverse group of people in a common direction. Pastor Andy Stanley, who oversees North Point Community Church, he recently explained why his ministry does not emphasize at all the teaching of the Bible during their Sunday services. This is what he said, quote, It is often effective to leverage common experiences and emotions without assuming a common belief system. We don't begin with theology. We don't begin with beliefs. We begin with what we have in common. Fears, joys, challenges, and a need for love. And that draws people in. We want to move people physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We want to take them from where they are to the place where we think God wants them to be. It's not an accident that most of the church flyers mailed out to the community, you know, the ones you get in your mailbox like I get in mine, you know, they rarely advertise 
like a real hearty biblical study? Like rarely do they have a biblical uh, emphasis or, or, or do they advertise any type of exposition? Like folks are instead invited to come to church to learn about God through the movies. Or, you know, a four-week seminar on parenting or 10 tips for financial freedom, on and on and on the list goes. Rarely have you ever gotten an ad that says, come to this church for a 50-minute hearty expositional Bible study through the Gospel of John, which we should do. Now, I need, to, I need to say, I do not question, I don't question, the desire of men like Andy Stanley to reach the lost for Jesus. That's not what I'm trying to do. Personally, I think he, along with other churches that fall into this category, are very sincere in their pursuit. I think they really want to see people come to know Jesus. And yet, the fundal, fundamental problem with this approach is that not only will you be hard-pressed to find an example where the church even existed for such a purpose, but as a method for evangelism, that model is completely and totally unbiblical. Look again at our passage. Paul is seeking to do what? He comes to Thessalonica seeking to reach a group of religious people who don't know Jesus. His purpose is hoping that they might recognize that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the basis for their salvation and not their religious beliefs or their heritage or their works. He wants them to accept Christ as their Savior. But do you notice how Paul seeks to accomplish that aim? His methodology is entirely Scripture-centric. As with Jesus and the precedent established in the book of Acts, it was the Bible that was Paul's fundamental tool for evangelism. According to our text, there were three ways that Paul used Scripture and his evangelistic approach. Look, look back. First, we're told that Paul used Scripture to what? To reason with them. To reason with them. In the Greek, this word reasoned means to mingle thought with thought. It's from this word that we get our English word, dialogue. And note, Paul is not preaching at these Thessalonians. Rather, he's simply engaging with them in a conversation about the Scriptures, about Jesus, about the Christ. You might call it conversational evangelism. Secondly, we see that Paul used Scripture to explain to them. In the Greek, this word explaining would be better translated as, as opening or enlightening. And, and really, it's an interesting word because it's used most often to describe Jesus' ministry. In recounting their experiences with the resurrected Christ on the road to Emmaus, there were two disciples who said this in Luke 24, verse 32. They said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened, same word, the scriptures to us. Then a few verses later, Jesus appears to the 11 apostles for the specific purposes of Luke 24, 45, opening their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. The resurrected Jesus, 40 days before the ascension, realizing he's got limited time, spends his time doing what? Teaching in the Bible, opening the scriptures. Why? because he knew it would be their responsibility to then explain the scriptures to others. What this tells us is that Paul did not base his arguments on his personal opinions. Instead, what Paul did, this opening to them, Paul is pointing to a much higher authority than himself. He's not sharing his opinions. He's pointing to what God's word said about the Christ, about his death, that he would have to rise, and then he begins to present Jesus. Paul's evangelistic ministry emphasized the teaching or opening of God's word because Paul saw Scripture as being the most effective way to reveal Jesus. Last Sunday, we looked at Philip and his unique ministry to the Ethiopian eunuch. And how did he preach Christ to the Ethiopian? 
through the prophet Isaiah. He's reading the prophet Isaiah. He's trying to understand, is, is the prophet talking about himself or some other man? And it's from there that Philip does what? Let me tell you about Jesus. In John chapter 1, the apostle declares, in the beginning was the word, and then some verses later he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Scripture is the most effective way to reveal Jesus because it's the way Jesus has chosen to reveal himself. Finally, note, Paul used Scripture to demonstrate for them. And the Greek, this word demonstrating, it means to place beside. The, the word indicates that Paul's scriptural arguments intended to present persuasive evidence, all designed to substantiate his positions about Jesus. He's laying aside evidence. Now, I hope you understand that the Christian faith, your faith, I hope you know that it is a reasonable faith. As Christians, we don't believe in the absence of evidence or reason. Instead, we believe because there is enough evidence to make our beliefs reasonable. Hebrews 11 verse 1 goes even further than this. Actually defining our faith as the substance of things hoped for. Something you can put your fingers around. The evidence of things not seen. That faith has substance and evidence. It's not blind belief. For three weeks, Paul gathers with these Thessalonians where he uses the scriptures to reason, to explain, and to demonstrate that Jesus was actually the long-awaited Savior, not just of themselves, but of the world. Which is interesting, right? Because Paul's methodology for reaching the lost in Thessalonica this lost but religious culture, it ran completely counterintuitive to this modern, seeker-friendly approach. It's the opposite. Instead of Stanley, quote, leveraging common experiences and emotions without assuming a common belief system or seeking to draw in his audience by appealing to common fears and joys and challenges and a need for love, Paul, Paul goes in, he's not interested in any of that, He's interested in presenting Christian theology and biblical doctrine, believing that by first correcting their misguided belief systems, the framework would be established by which they would reject the religious basis for salvation and accept Jesus. You know what's been said? The best way to contrast a lie is to simply present the truth the best way to know if that shelf above the toilet is crooked is to get out a level. It will tell you. While the text is clear, Paul's arguments were hard to discredit. We should point out that there was a mixed reaction, right? We're told though only some of the Jews were persuaded and a great number of Greeks joined Paul and Silas, Different reactions. Some, a great multitude. Which leads to another point we can't overlook. I hope you know. Teaching the Bible in a religious culture polarized Paul's audience. Luke says a great multitude of the Greeks joined them. Which subsequently implies a great multitude of the Jews chose not to join them. Like, like, understand this, and this is what you need to know about your church. We have no disillusionment. Like, we know that a Bible-centric ministry model will not appeal to everyone. As a matter of fact, in this instance, the Word of God was actually used by Paul to parse the crowd, revealing two different intentions— Based on their reaction to God's word, these Greeks, hey, they were revealed to be genuine seekers. With these Jews being nothing more than religious pretenders. You see, this reality 
is really one of the main reasons that seeker-friendly churches avoid teaching the Bible. You see, as this passage illustrates, teaching the Bible will yield one of two reactions. Teaching the Bible will either force a person out of their religious comfort, or it will force that person out of your church. It's fascinating. God's word. Well, why did that person leave? Well, truth was kind of hard. And I get it. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we're actually told that the, the word of God is living and powerful. But then we're told this, that it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It is used to pierce even the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God does things. The reason that this is the case is that the Bible's message for the seeker or the unchurched, let's, can we be real that it's brutally honest and in many ways demanding? Apart from a saving relationship with Jesus, the Bible doesn't present you many good options. You accept Jesus or the Bible gives you some brutal truths. You're lost in your sins. You're alienated from God. You're condemned to hell. The presentation of truth will very likely offend a person comfortable in their sin. You see, the Bible doesn't ease people in. It calls people out. The Bible doesn't placate to your situation. It calls you to account. The Bible condemns both religious moralism, worldly relativism, or paganism alike. Sure, the Bible tells the seeker, God loves you just the way that you are. But the Bible is then radically honest that his plan is not to leave you that way. God's desire is that you repent. That's what he asks the seeker, to repent of your rebellion, to die to whatever you are, and allow Jesus to transform you more into the image and likeness of himself. The Bible tells the seeker, Friend, you're not okay. Don't, I'm not going to tell you to feel good about yourself. You're in a heap load of trouble. <laughs> Jesus' love doesn't accept your brokenness. His love is designed to heal you of brokenness. The reality is that the Bible does not present a populist message. It can't be packaged for the masses because the truth really is offensive. Truth is divisive. You see, the falsehood can have a big party with all other falsehoods, but it's the, it's the truth that stands out and says, I can't join the party. In many ways, the message of the Bible is not friendly. It's not friendly which is why it's often not used in trying to reach the seeker. It forces a seeker to either respond and accept Jesus, or it just gives the justification for that person to get upset, call you names, and leave. <laughs> which is why the seeker-friendly model avoids difficult truths in order to successfully appeal to larger crowds and no one likes being called names. Under the <clears throat> what to expect section of a seeker-friendly church's website that's in our community, this is what you'll read. Quote, We believe God calls us to pursue him just as we are, inside and out. So we nurture a casual, fun, and inviting atmosphere. As our guests, you can check out our services without intrusion, and begin your spiritual journey at your own pace. No pressure, just encouragement. That sounds great. 
The problem is, is that statement completely overlooks the reality that by definition, one can never pursue God without the initial act of repentance. Can't ease you in if you're going the wrong direction. You see, while these churches find themselves overflowing on Sunday morning, I am convinced that there is an unintended consequence to that particular model of ministry, especially in the South. You see, in the South, there is a huge segment of the population who wants church to satisfy the compulsion to feel spiritual without the actual challenge to be spiritual. Because most Southerners are religiously inclined, just like the Thessalonians, but pagan in practice. You know, Sunday Christians? Attending a church that targets unbelievers, is designed for unbelievers, preaches to unbelievers, well, it does have the perfect appeal. You see, church designed for the unchurched fosters the perfect environment for the lukewarm Christian, a Christian in name only, to thrive. Why? Because they're never challenged. This church allows a person to satisfy a cultural compulsion to feel like a good Christian. Stimulating worship, entertaining programming, helpful antidotes, service opportunities, on and on and on. But this church never forces that person to face weightier matters as to what it means to be a Christian. It's not feeling like one, it's being one. And you'll never get that without sermons in the Bible that address topics that are not fun, like sin. Yeah. Or your need to repent of that sin. Or the fact that if you don't, there is judgment. Or that as a good Christian, you'll face persecution. It's not all health and wealth. Or let's talk about what it really means to be holy and set apart. Because the primary focus of our service, like what we do here at Calvary 316, because our focus is not designed to create a comfortable environment for the unchurch to not feel threatened. But instead, since our focus is on the development of healthy Christians, living genuine lives transformed by Jesus through the faithful teaching of God's word. The truth is that the person who gravitates to the seeker-friendly church experience is not going to find Calvary 316 appealing. It's the truth. And as your pastor, I'm totally cool with that. And here's why. I'm not fearful of the seeker church moving in next door or buying property to build a building. Here's why. We are not going to appeal to the same crowd. While the people who gravitate their direction wouldn't find our pews very comfortable for long, although I don't think any of you find our pews very comfortable for long, it's also a reality that the people our church appeals to don't go to those churches because you see right through the facade. You see through the charade. We have people that come to our church from those, and this is what they tell me. <laughs> I needed to get fed. Which is a marketing campaign I would really love to do. Now that you're saved, come to 316 and get fed and put them out in front of those churches. If anyone wants to take the idea and do it without permission, knock yourselves out. Here's the deal. We're comfortable with this because we teach the Bible knowing what it'll do. Which, why is it our job to tell the Bible what it should and shouldn't do? You see, the Bible will divide a religious culture. It will divide a religious culture into those who are genuine Christ followers and those who are simply plain Christian. See, I'm okay with the fact that our philosophy of biblical teaching yields such a result because... It means Calvary 316 is, is filled typically with three types of people. One, it's filled with Christians who are serious about their faith. Or it's filled with the Christians who've given up on church and find a place that is genuine and authentic 
and real warts and all, that's a grace place, refreshing. A community that's just trying to do it the way the Bible says to do it. Like we'll either be filled with the people who are serious about growing, who have given up on church and are like, wow, this is what I've been looking for, or, and this is what I'm excited about, I really do believe that we'll be filled with seekers that are genuinely looking for truth. You see, the, the person, this person, a genuine seeker, I'm convinced they end up being repelled by churches that play games. I found in personal conversations that they get turned off with slick marketing techniques or candy to earn confidence. Genuine seekers, they want a church experience that doesn't emulate or seek to replicate their experience in the world. They were already sick of that, which is why they're looking or seeking. You see, I think a genuine seeker is daring enough to come to a place that will speak the truth in love. You know the irony to all of this? Many of these seeker churches hail from what's known as the Willow Creek style of ministry. What makes that ironic is that a few years ago, Willow Creek Community Church, they did something really daring. They hired an independent firm to conduct a three-year study to, quote, find a way to measure spiritual growth and to see whether the church was accomplishing its mission to facilitate that growth. They wanted to actually quantify their ministry approach and see if it worked. What's mind-blowing is that not only did they pay for this study to be done, but then they published it and a little document that's called Reveal. And guess what it did? Their own study challenged their entire seeker-friendly model of ministry. This is a line from the report. I have a copy of it. Quote, we learned, check this out. We learned that the most effective strategy for moving people forward in their journey of faith is, want to take a guess? Biblical engagement. Our study revealed that churches that are successful in producing genuine spiritual growth in the lives of people embed the Bible in everything. These churches breathe scripture, hands down, no contest. When it comes to spiritual growth, nothing beats the Bible. <laughs> Duh! That's what we've been saying. So you have to ask, is it about really seeing spiritual growth or just getting a lot of money from a lot of people? Verse 5. But the Jews were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Poor dude. And sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, speaking of Paul and Silas and Timothy, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security or money from Jason and the rest, they let them go. <laughs> I'm afraid one of the reasons... Today's American church is failing to influence our society is that in the attempts to appeal to culture, we have forgotten that Jesus instituted the church to be set apart from culture. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a huge difference between a church seeking to appeal to culture as opposed to a church that wants to remain relevant. Modernizing facilities, creating a contemporary aesthetic, employing creative graphics and multimedia, even incorporating new styles of, of music to remain relevant with culture, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We embrace it. The church should never seem antiquated. You know why? Because we're heavenly. However, the problem is that all too often in order to a appeal to culture, the seeker church ends up employing techniques aimed at appeasing culture. Let me define appeasement. Appeasement is defined as, quote, the diplomatic policy of making concessions to an enemy power in order to avoid conflict. That's the formal definition. Instead of letting truth 
speak for itself by faithfully teaching the Bible in the pursuit of being friendly with the lost world around them, many pastors neuter the message, hoping to make the gospel more attractive, pleasing, interesting, (laughs) enjoyable in the process. But here's the problem. Not only does appeasement, by definition, fail to enact any type of lasting change, but historically, we don't have much respect for appeasers. One example, you're going to have a hard time finding any apologists for the way Neville Chamberlain approached the growing threat of Nazism. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the best way to go about it. Really worked out. No. The church would be wise to remember that rebellion, not appeasement, is the only way to affect real change in a culture. Now, whether or not you agree with the impact you can't escape the reality that revolutionaries, you can reject what they did, but you can't reject the reality that revolutionaries are are only remembered because they specifically yielded actions against the status quo, and in doing so, it was paramount in changing the status quo. They had actions against the status quo, and it was those actions that yielded a change. You see, Paul had no interest in appeal. (laughs) He was far from an appeaser, right? Paul. Paul was a revolutionary. Publicly known. He had the reputation. What did our text just say? Of turning the world upside down. The world. Paul contrasted the lie with the truth. He literally shined a light into the eye of the darkness. Paul was bold and brazen and unafraid and tenacious. Paul spoke the word of God with conviction, and you know what? He was totally polarizing as a result, and he didn't care. Paul's actions, check this out were directly responsible for yielding division. Paul went in and divided communities. He raged against the machine. He created enemies literally everywhere he went. Paul ticked off the religious establishment, was on a first-name basis with the local authorities, spent nights in jail. Paul came to a town, spoke truth, and so impacted culture that people were saved from the clutches of hell, gave their lives to Jesus, a church was birthed in that community, and a violent mob was spawned. In conclusion, life. Life is about submission and rebellion and the tightrope between the two. You see, both are central to the human spirit. Now here's the key, though. Always know what you rebel against determines what you'll live in submission to. If you rebel against God, well, you're going to live as a servant of the world. You're not a rebel. You're a serf. You're a pawn. Part of the machine. But here's the thing. If you submit to God... You know what will happen? You will rebel against this world. You will be a rebel. It will be just the natural and unavoidable outcome. And you know what? Some people will be offended. What you rebel against determines what you'll live in submission to, and what you submit to will determine what you rebel against. I've mentioned before the church of Jesus Christ. The church, our church, should be seen as the most dangerous institution on the planet. We're a group of dangerous people. Not interested in this. We're interested in taking people to another place. My dad told me a story. He went to a community 
It was a growing church. He got lost. He was trying to find the church building. And he ended up pulling into a parking lot of a bar slash strip club slash gas station, one of those places. And the guy was walking out, and he rolled the window down. He said, yo, where is this church? Guy looked at him and says, why? I was like, well, because I, I want to go attend the service. Why would you want to do that? My dad's like, why are you asking me all these questions? He said, he said, I wouldn't go there, man. Because it's dangerous. I've had a lot of friends go there. They come out different. Like it's doing things to this area. It's just not cool. My dad thought, it's kind of all I needed to know about it. The church was known by the community as being dangerous because of the impact it was making. <laughs> a rebel church, a church of rebels, that's what I want to be. Shock rocker, Alice Cooper. <laughs> You're going to get an Alice Cooper quote this morning. Most interestingly, became a follower of Jesus after he made a name for himself. But this is a radical observation he made. He said, drinking beer is easy. Trashing your hotel room is easy. But being a Christian, that's a tough call. That's real rebellion. And I agree. As you leave this morning, there are two things I want you to take home. One, figure out who you want to serve and then rebel against the other. And two, once you've figured that out, may I suggest you pick your church community accordingly. Do you want to be a part of a church of rebels who unashamedly proclaim the truth of God's word without fear of reprisal or whether or not it will draw a crowd? Or would you rather support a culture of appeasement because it allows you to feel good without the challenge to be holy. It's your choice. But I don't know about you. But may the accusation be made of Calvary 316, that we are a rebel church, filled with men and women more interested in turning our world upside down than creating a safe space. So Father, it's with that.